Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the monthly chart of silver, and I've drawn in a couple of indicators here. Uh, the top one is the Chai Kin, and the other one is accumulation distribution. They're pretty much the same indicator. You can see if we go to the daily, we'll start with the daily here. You can see very negative on both of them. And then the weekly is also extremely negative. And then of course the monthly is absolutely frightening. The accumulation distribution is absolutely plumbing the depths of some unknown figure that no one has ever even heard of before. And then the Chai Kin, which is really just a 10 day uh, moving average of the accumulation distribution uh, is not quite a new low. So this is what it is. Accumulation distribution index line is a technical analysis indicator intended to relate price and volume in the stock market and act as a leading indicator of price movements. Whereas the uh, Ch Chai Kin oscillator is formed by subtracting a 10 day exponential moving average from a three day exponential moving average of the accumulation distribution index being an indicator of an indicator, it can give serious sell or buy signals. So what signals is it giving here? I think you could probably say that if both of these are giving an indicator that the market's broken. That's the only thing I can take away from this. Uh, what could it possibly mean when an indicator does something like that? It doesn't even make any sense. There, there, there aren't even any signals on it. It's just in a straight downtrend. Now, what does it really mean? Well, I think it's clear. It means that the paper silver has been under distribution this entire time. That's what's been going on. This is just another indication to me that we have this long-standing paper manipulation, suppression of prices. You can see that they're just distributing, selling, 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 selling fake silver until the indicator actually hits over a billion, which is incredible. So that's pretty much all that that indicator means. Uh, as far as silver, the silver chart without any of these indicators on it, um, we're still just forming that bottom. It's a very, very long-term bottom to be formed. Uh, you can see we still have the bull uptrend going, but we're definitely um, touching around to the bottom. Do I think we're going to go into new lows? I can't see it. We could. And I've got a uh, a coin to watch here that if if we do get a decrease in prices, uh, that's something we want to take a look at. So let's jump over to the we'll jump over to the Bitcoin price chart first of all. So this is uh, Bitcoin price in uh, this is off the Huobi index. The reason I use that is because it's the most active volume wise. 99% of Bitcoin volume now is in Chinese Yuan. So they're actually 99% of all cryptocurrency volume is in, is in the Chinese currency. So they're going to be the trend centers. You can see a very, very clear pennant formation forming and uh, it's definitely tightening up. Uh, it's getting into that breakout range. Um, it, it has been before a couple times where you could have drawn it, you know, tighter. But uh, it's definitely forming up that pennant. Uh, should we move through 500? Uh, we'll go to let's let's go to the Bitfinex chart here. So if if we get through that 500 price on Bitcoin, it's fairly clear that we're going to get that next run up to wherever that's going to be, because that will clearly be a breakout of this long held pennant you could see that the bottom was formed back in the summer of 2015 with this uh, Bitfinex low uh, and this the, remember I pointed this out before this was a futures driven low I can't seem to get the spot on it this is actually a futures driven low on Bitfinex uh, the Bitcoin price, I mean, you could have bought Bitcoin on Bitfinex for that. It you, would have been very hard, yet would have had to been very fast. So it this spiked lower. But you can see that's uh, the formation of this pennant. Very long uh, formation. 
but it, it seems to be coming towards resolution. Now, on the total market cap of the cryptocurrencies, you can see that we're up here around nine billion. So we're still testing that top. Uh, this is according to market cap rank, and you can see we've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Capricorn. Now, the the move by Ethereum, I've covered that. It went over a billion dollars in market cap. This this move that Ethereum made. It's actually possible for any of these coins to make this kind of a move because essentially they serve the same function. Now, uh, this Capricorn coin is, uh, I'd never even heard of it. You can see it's all the way up here at $164 million market cap. You can see on the 90 day period, it's up 804%. Uh, really only eclipsed by Ethereum. You can see over 180 days, Ethereum is up 1,500%. That's a 15-fold move. I uh, actually used Ethereum to get my coins off of Cripsy. I should have just left them in Ethereum. But uh, hindsight's 2020. So another coin that I have here that I'm excited about is a Florin coin that just went through a hard fork. Uh, and the reason why I, I picked that coin I own a significant percentage of that coin is that um, it was my projection that it would be able to solve the torrent censorship problem and uh, hopefully it would make a big move. So it has started to make a move. It's 108 on the market cap. But again, uh, any of these coins can perform the function, uh, th the main function, which is to transmit wealth anywhere in the world from one computer to another. They can all do that. But then they also have all kinds of other functions uh, that they perform. So none of them are going away. I do expect fairly soon to see that $10 billion market cap being broached. Again, as I mentioned, you can see when we pull the exchanges. Actually, I think it's a 24-hour volume. You can see 98.46% of Bitcoin volume is in CNY, whereas only 1.13% of Bitcoin volume is in US dollars and 0.2% is in euros. Now, a lot of people have said the Chinese are exaggerating their volume. They may be. I mean, this seems a little bit crazy. Uh, OK, coin and Huobi added together equals 5 million Bitcoin turnover when there's only, what, 14, 15 million Bitcoins in the entire world. Don't know. I don't really know of a way of proving that, but we'll just have to wait and see. So uh, the main story of the night, and then I'm going to get to that coin pick here. I'm just going to cover this article briefly. This is uh, from the Washington Times, and uh, it's basically talking about how uh, the structure that a government decides to put in place, whether it's free market, communist, or a mix of the two, is ultimately going to be the determine the determiner of how wealthy the country becomes. Now, I was I came across this article because I was doing research on Puerto Rico, and uh, they have about seventy two billion dollars in debt. They're rapidly losing their productive people. Uh, they just had the attacks that they basically tried to. Uh, do essentially a tax that amounted to being a bill of attainder against Walmart. Essentially, they, they structured the law so that it taxed, tripled, tripled Walmart's taxes and seized all the profits on the island. And a judge just struck that down today as being illegal, uh, which he should have. But uh, Puerto Rico is a basket case. And of course, we've got Paul Ryan, who is uh, in there trying to uh, get some control board appointed. We'll, we'll read about this here. And, and why is it so important for the Republicans? Well, I, as you guys know, I've covered lying Ted Cruz. And uh, lying Ted Cruz is just like Paul Ryan, just like John Boehner. Um, these people are not conservatives, and they do not uh, represent their party. They're basically traitors who represent someone else and not the people that they claim they represent. So why is it that Paul Ryan, who everyone knows, he's actually going to face a challenge here because he's, uh, you know, he's another rhino. He's not a conservative. Um, 
and uh, he, he may lose his uh, he's going to be challenged by a conservative businessman he may lose his seat but um, why is Ryan doing this well because Ryan represents the powers that be and I think that Ryan has to cobble together some kind of bailout for Puerto Rico because remember the way the black swan thing works it can come out of anywhere and a crisis in the municipal bond market could actually begin in Puerto Rico and if it does it could spread so they're not interested in the the health and well-being of the people of Puerto Rico uh, that's not why Paul Ryan is getting involved he's interested in uh, preserving things for his Wall Street masters and keeping things from unraveling but let's read this article uh, comparing the three Puerto Rico Hong Kong and Cuba and then I'll comment why is Hong Kong rich Cuba very poor and Puerto Rico struggling Back in 1955, the islands of Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Hong Kong had roughly the same real per capita income. They each took very different economic paths. Now, some 60 years later, Hong Kong is even richer than the United States on a per capita income basis. Cuba is an economic disaster, having gone from the richest Caribbean nation to the poorest next to Haiti. And Puerto Rico finds itself flirting with bankruptcy, with a per capita income much higher than Cuba's, but only roughly half that of Hong Kong. Incomes have increased approximately 22-fold in Hong Kong, 11-fold in Puerto Rico, and only 4-fold at best in Cuba in little over a half a century. Cuba became a communist nation with the Soviet Union Russia as its economic big brother, from which it received considerable subsidies. Puerto Rico has had the United States as its big brother. It's a largely self-governing territory of the U.S., from which it has received considerable economic assistance. Hong Kong was a largely self-governing territory of the United Kingdom until 1997, when it became again a largely self-governing territory under China. Neither Britain nor China has provided subsidies to Hong Kong. Cuba is relatively rich in natural resources. Puerto Rico has some, but Hong Kong has almost none. The improbable success of Hong Kong and the improbable failure of Cuba is a direct result of the economic policies each followed. Hong Kong is perhaps the best example of what can be achieved under the rule of law with limited government and free markets. Cuba is a poster child of how rule by man, rule by a man, specifically Castro, rather than law, coupled with government ownership of the means of production and the destruction of the price system, results in no freedom and a great deal of poverty. The Cubans like to brag about their health care system while ignoring the fact that when faced with a really serious illness, high-level Cuban officials have been known to go to Spain or other places for medical care. Life expectancy is a good proxy for overall health care, and it is true and it is true that among poor countries, Cuba ranks high, but Puerto Rico has a slightly higher life expectancy and has made greater gains in Cuba over the last half century, and Hong Kong has one of the highest life expectancies in the world at 84. Puerto Rico, while largely a free market economy, has been plagued by corruption, destructive unionism, and crony capitalism. The result has been a rapid increase in debt, which the government says it can no longer service, the economic stagnate and econ economic stagnation. Many of Puerto Rico's most productive and educated citizens have moved to the U.S. mainland. The Puerto Rican fiscal problem has now reached crisis proportions. The government is currently selling assets from the pension funds, which may be illegal, to pay money dedicated to one group of creditors to other creditors, as well as pay for government services. The U.S. Congress is now considering creating an oversight board with sufficient powers to deal with the debt and the underlying fiscal problems. And it goes on. You can finish the rest of the article. So pretty obvious there that uh, three island nations basically at the same uh, economic level started off in 1955, ended up in very different places. It doesn't have to do with the natural resources. It doesn't have to do with the race of the people. It doesn't have to do with anything except the policies that are followed by the government in place. And Cuba and Puerto Rico are policy failures. And of course, Hong Kong is a success. Now, do I expect Puerto Rico to turn around 
No, I don't, because uh, I've cited the figures. Uh, 25% of the workforce works for the government. Many of the productive people have left the island. Uh, it's just, it's gone too far. Things have to completely collapse. Now, Cuba, on the other hand, it may well be the case that Cuba may turn around. I'm not really sure what they have planned for Cuba. Uh, if they turn around and open everything up, I don't know. Another thing about these countries is that they actually have, if you pull their currencies, you'll see a one-for-one one peg. Basically, the Puerto Rican peso, the Hong Kong dollar, and even the Cuban peso, believe it or not, are essentially pegged one-to-one one with the U.S. dollar. So that's a very interesting thing to notice, supposedly, and I never really bought into the entire Cuban story that supposedly they were mortal enemies of the U.S. The whole story kind of stunk from the beginning, and you can see here on a long-term chart, you've got this one-to-one -one peg going all the way back to 2006 on this chart. Uh, so kind of suspicious that um, a country that's supposedly not under U.S. control uh, has a one-to-one -one peg with the U.S. dollar. You also have the strange Guantanamo Bay base down there. So uh, I don't really trust a lot of uh, information that we're fed about Cuba. Something is definitely going on there. So let's uh, finish up with this coin pick. Now, I pointed out recently that I was looking at the 5 and 10 ounce on the the Lunar Series 2, specifically this 5-ounce Monkey. And I happen to notice today going through them that uh, that over at JM Bullion, they have about 318 of these 5-ounce uh, Monkeys. And you can see the price here is, for 10 plus, you can get them for as low as $103. So for a five ounce coin, we're talking $20 an ounce, uh, which is about $4.75 above spot. Now that's a very, very good price. I have not seen the half ounce, the best ounce price for those is around 22 to 23. As we covered last time, the two ounce is even higher. The one ounce is between 23 and 24. So. I'm seriously considering this five ounce coin. Now, the other reason is this may be some kind of mispricing. The other two places this coin is available are actually asking 150 for the coin. So a big difference in pricing. Is this a mispricing? It may be. Uh, so these may be worth snapping up uh, for those who are thinking about speculating on, on a fairly quick appreciation. Uh, I think it may just be a mispricing. I have no idea what actual price is quoted to these uh, mints that order from the Perth Mint, uh, how much they have to pay above spot. But I would say it looks to me like JM Bullion's trying to move this coin. I can't imagine that they're making very much profit off of this coin. And so that might be a big opportunity for some members. So back to the main story, silver is still forming a very, very, very long uh, rising uh, cup sort of pattern here. Many, many years. Uh, the technical indicators are completely skewed, indicating that basically it's been in a gigantic manipulated sell-off. Um, is this the bottom? Yes, I think it is the bottom uh, for, for quite some time, but how long will it be before we get uh, a fairly serious rise. That I can't say, and we'll talk to you next time.